So I'm not sure if we're ready. Um, welcome. This is our last third night of this year's uh, parish mission. As I said in the beginning on Monday, uh, one of the results of the uh, synodal process in parish and archdiocese was the desire of the married couples to have some ministry, some attention given to them. And uh, this is just a little bit of a... Um, uh, element of that attention that I want to give to you to uh, uh, use the resources that we have with uh, Tom and Lena uh, to be uh, understanding of what marriage really is uh, because if we don't understand even what marriage is then we cannot know what we need as married couples so this is the, the beginning the starting point of understanding the total union of a, a marriage in sacramental context of the church um, so, as I said, third day for the uh, next hour or so, uh, Tom, I, today, uh, two in one, definitely in one, uh, as Lena is not here, but um, not physically, but spiritually. Um, take it over. Thanks, Father. Can you hear me okay? Uh, so, uh, see a couple new faces. I'm Tom Hockle. Uh, my wife, Lena, uh, had surgery last week, and she has been really out of it. She made the college trial last night and came, but she really couldn't do anything. She just kind of sat and gave me moral support more than anything else, and she was wiped out last night, and she's wiped out today. So unfortunately, I'm solo again, and you just get me. So you're stuck with me. I'm happy to be back for our third night. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in the, last, uh, the first two nights including the influence of uh, our families of origin and the culture on marriage and our attitudes about love and about marriage. And then last night, um, we covered some further ground in, in talking about, uh, well, we did marriage in our culture and, and started talking about the sacrament of marriage. We ended off uh, talking about uh, the, the vow, the, the end of the, the beginning of the sacrament being the vows. And I wanted to reiterate something. Um, uh, well, let me, before I do that, we talked about how you form, what's necessary to form a sacramental marriage, right? And we looked at the civil marriage, natural marriage, and sacramental marriage. When it comes to sacramental marriage, we touched on the fact that it can't be dissolved uh, and that annulments, for example, people talk about it as being Catholic divorce, that's a misconception. That an annulment means there was a defect at the beginning uh, that prevented a sacrament from being formed. If a sacramental marriage has been formed, it can't be dissolved. We talked about that over and over again. I want to mention some conditions for the creation of a sacramental marriage, which I touched on very briefly in talking about annulments. But in order to form a sacramental marriage, I mean, obviously we've seen it's kind of a big deal, right? It's kind of a big commitment. You're entering into a permanent, exclusive, faithful, fruitful union. This is going to last the rest of your life. And, and I, I impress that up on the couples, you know, and I don't pull, I don't pull punches. You know, this is, this is a lifelong commitment here. So if we're going to do that, we've got to make sure we're meeting some uh, criteria to ensure that we have the proper matter here for this sacrament. So, f for example, you have to have sufficient knowledge. You need to know what you're getting into. And that's part of the reason why we take marriage preparation seriously and meet with couples one-on-one -on -one over many days or meet with them over weekends and talk to them about what we're doing in this. And I, you know, I, hope, I hope you all have some better understanding or have a reinforced understanding of, of what sacramental marriage means after the talk last night. And, and that you then can bring that out to people in the world, to people you're coming in touch with, you know, family members, kids, uh, friends, you know, especially Catholics who are getting ready to get married and want to get married in the church. Let's make sure they know what they're doing and, mo and make sure they understand the good news of marriage. So do they have sufficient knowledge? Do they have emotional maturity? It's a huge undertaking, right? Are they emotionally capable of doing what they say they're doing in these vows? We need to make sure that, that that's there. Third, freedom of consent. You know, we talked about the two great powers human beings have, to know and to will. We've talked about knowing what they're doing. Well, can they consent to what they're doing? 
Are they doing it for some reason like duress? You know, familiar pressure. Is there some financial motive that's really the reason? I shared with you my, my own second son's experience. Uh, he started dating uh, his girlfriend when they were mid-teenagers, and they got married pretty early. Um, I didn't tell you this part. I'm in the marriage, so Father knows about this. The, the priest wants to meet with people and talk to them and make sure that, hey, you know, does these people know what they're doing when they're getting into this, and are they ready for this? Did, and uh, I went into that meeting, and the priest sat me down, and, and he said, uh, Tom, uh, ha- has he ever been married before? I said, no, no, no. And he looked at me quizzically, and he said, are you, are you sure he's never been married before? I said, no, what are you talking about? He's never been married before. He said, are you sure? Like, it's like Peter, do you love me? A third time, right? And he says, no, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Father. He says... Yeah, he, he got married already. He got, he got married like eight months ago. I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? He's like, well, they had gone down to City Hall and gotten married. I had no idea. We had, she didn't tell anybody. And they did that for financial reasons. He was in uh, 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 his master's program after college. Uh, he figured out they could get really cheap loans if they did it. And so they went down and got hitched at the courthouse and, uh, and got their loans. And that was a red flag to me, obviously. But even I, with my training and understanding and knowledge, didn't dig deeper with him. I didn't do his marriage prep. Of course, he didn't want to do it with me, right? So had, he, had he, I had him in marriage prep, I would have been digging on that and saying, what's really going on here? Why are you getting married? Because then we did a church wedding and... I came to find out later that it was really her family that was pressuring this to happen. He didn't really want to do it. And so I'm certain they, they had a defect at the beginning of that that probably prevented a sacrament. I'm not the marriage tribunal. It's not for me to decide. But if they, I was called to testify, you know, I'd testify about that thing. They did it for reasons that, was, that, that were not genuine. That's something we have to get into and make sure that you know, we have a freedom of consent, and, and four, no existing bonds that are previous, right? Do you have a marriage in your background that, you know, was a valid marriage, and you, you know, it wasn't annullable because it was a marriage? Well, guess what? You're not free to marry. You're, not, you're already covenantally sealed to somebody else. You're not free to come marry again. We have to explore that. And finally, do you have an openness to having children? You know, and this is an issue now. A lot of people come into marriage thinking, you know, hey, I, I want to get married, but I don't want any kids. I, I'll never have kids. I don't want them. Well, guess what? You're not talking about marriage then. You're not talking about sacramental marriage. So that, that in itself can prevent the formation of a valid sacramental marriage. The, you know, the couple, as we talked about last night, if, assuming they have all this, every, all those features are met, they enter into this, they, they then say some vows. And we talked about the ratification of the marriage. The marriage is complete, it's ratified at the time of the vows. I wanted to take a minute tonight to look at those vows a little more closely. You know, first, the minister uh, says, Tom and Lena, have you come here to enter into our marriage without coercion, freely and wholeheartedly? What do we see in that first line? Some of the things we've been talking about, right? Lack of duress. If you come here freely and wholeheartedly, do you have the emotional maturity? Do you have the knowledge? It's right there, hitting at it from the very beginning of the, mer- uh, of, of the wedding ceremony, right? And those vows. Are you here without coercion, freely and wholeheartedly? Are, are you prepared, knowledge, as you follow the path of marriage? to love and honor each other for as long as you both shall live. Hey, there's permanence. We talked about permanence. It's right there in the vows. You both shall live is pretty unambiguous, right? <clears throat> it doesn't say as long as you both shall feel close to one another. It doesn't say as long as you both shall fulfill your obligations. Uh, it, no, it's not a contract. You're being sealed. 
Are you prepared to accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and His church? Hey, there's that last one we talked about. Openness to life. Right? It's right there built in. And then when we say our vows, I, Tom, take you, Lena, to be my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and bad and sickness and health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. The essential nature of marriage is right there in the vows. And it's beautiful. If we, we, We've already looked at this and we know exactly what we're doing. None of this nonsense of making up our own vows up there and saying, I promise to love you as much as the sunset. You know, or I, I, as deep as the ocean. No, I'm talking the rest of our lives. I, I love the freedom of this, of the vows of Catholic marriage. I love the freedom. I know exactly what I'm getting. I'm getting all of you. You're getting all of me. It's a beautiful thing. And once that marriage has been consummated, it's sealed. In the Catechism of the, of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1640, the marriage bond has been established by God Himself in such a way that marriage concluded and consummated between baptized persons can never be dissolved. This bond, which results from the human act of the spouses and their consummation of the marriage is a reality henceforth irrevocable and gives rise to a covenant guaranteed by God's fidelity. The church does not have the power to contravene this disposition of divine wisdom. The catechism is so beautiful and so clear about it. It's so clear and beautiful. It results from our free... We consent to have God seal us in a covenant irrevocably. It's a beautiful act of free will. So, when we talk about a one flesh union, we don't mean that metaphorically. We mean that literally. We are united into one flesh. And it can't be separated. And not coincidentally, the act which consummates the marriage, that is marital intercourse, is also the act by which a new human being may be generated. Sexual intimacy is part of God's plan to make sex sacred in marriage because human beings are sacred. We want an institution in which the generation of the sacred human being made in the image and likeness of God is dignified for that possibility. And every time, I mentioned this last night, every time a couple makes love, they are embodying with their bodies, they're acting out with their bodies what they said with their vows. And I just think that's the most beautiful thing ever. We don't talk about that enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that a little more in relation to the next topic, which is uh, sex in marriage. Now, everybody here is married, so, you know, I probably don't have much to, to say that you don't already know on this, but and, and engaged couples, I'm sure they think the same thing. But I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to try to convey to you, as we did when we talked about love and marriage, a little bit of a juxtaposition between society's view of sex that prevails and the church's view of sex. And I think it's worth reminding all of us, whether we've been married five years or 50 years, because it's a big one. The church teaches that we're spirit and body. We take the body seriously. We're not, we're not Gnostics who believe we're like trapped in a body, you know, that we're spirits really, that our bodies don't matter. We're, we're what Aristotle would call hylomorphic beings. We're made up of matter and form, body and spirit, okay? And they're united. The body and spirit have equal importance. And the church wants us to be happy in marriage. The church wants harmony and unity and life. And intimacy is an important part of that. We often think the church teaches, you know, oh, sex is bad. Or, and maybe you had an experience with somebody in your past, you know, who, who kind of gave that attitude. Sex is, you know, it's something we have to do to create kids, but otherwise we don't really talk about it. And, and that's unfortunate. 
because that's not the good news. The good news about sex is that it has a, a deep and meaningful expression within marriage. Let's, let, before we talk about that, how does society view sex? It often treats sex as a means to an end, a way of getting something. Think about this for a second, right? It's often used as a direct sales tool, right? The woman eating a cheeseburger on the hood of a car, you know, in a, a swimsuit. What does this, that have to do with a cheeseburger? Nothing, obviously, right? But they're using sex to sell something. Sex is often used as a direct means of money. We actually sell it. Now there's a website called OnlyFans where your average woman can just create a website and show everything to everyone and make gobs of money doing it, right? Pornography and prostitution uh, are rampant, and it's a, often a means to popularity, right? If I'm sexy, if I have sex appeal, people will like me. <clears throat> sex is often treated as something you, a, a thing you do when you reach a certain age or level of maturity, right? We talk about it sort of as a rite of passage, we call, quote-unquote, adult conduct, you know, or adult content, that stuff where we get to see everything, where right? we get to, get to see people's naked bodies and what they do with them. That's what adults are allowed to do. It's an it, a thing that we can do. Um, we, even, we even understand in today's parlance that dating presumes sex. I did not know this, by the way, until maybe 10 years ago, 7 years ago, apparently when you say you're dating someone now, that means you're having sex with them. Who's heard that? Anybody heard that before? It's a thing. So if you say, if a kid says I'm dating, it now means we're having sex. Okay, just to give you a heads up on that. Um, but it's, you know, it's a rite of passage. Hey, we're dating. So now that we're dating, it's a thing we do. Society often treats sex as just another activity among others. It's viewed as a recreational activity. We speak of it as an object, doing it, getting it, having some. Uh, what's, we, even, we even say it has its own par, uh, part of our life called our sex life. It, like there's our work life, you know, there's our friend life, there's our sports life, and there's our sex life. It's an activity among a bunch of other activities that we carve out and put in this little mold over here. Here's a scene from a movie not too long ago, No Strings Attached. Uh, and and the, guy sa the, the girl says, hey, do you want to do this? And he says, do what? Use each other for sex at all hours of night, day and night, nothing else. Yeah, I could do that. That's going to be fun. What's the message in there? Sex is just a recreational activity. We can choose among other recreational activities. It's an it. It's a thing. We rate sex. We see it as something that, uh, you know, it's a performance, a technique that we're, that we're rating. I, I, you used to be able to not go through a, a, mag, a, a supermarket checkout without seeing magazine covers that tell you the, the next 10 great sex moves or 25 sex moves or 30. I mean, I, for a while I wanted to count them all up whenever I'd see a new magazine and say, how, how many are there exactly? Because every time there was 10 new ones, right? But, but magazine covers are there to tell you how to do it, how to, how to make it something even better. There's, it's, it's a thing that's technique-oriented. It's all about how you do it. We look at it as an, a thing we deserve, you know? You deserve better sex, Cosmo tells us. Right? It's an activity that you deserve to do and have when you want it, how you want it. Society tells us that sex is something we do based on feelings, how we feel about it. Do I feel arousal for someone else? Do I feel close to them? Do I feel excitement? If I feel that passion, if I have those feelings, that takes priority, and it's about choosing what I want to do, and indulge those feelings or not. And that has some serious consequences, because if that's what sex is, an activity I do when I have certain feelings, and it really has nothing to do with anything else, well, what's the limiting factor there? In marriage, I might feel those feelings for somebody else who's not my spouse. If, if I buy into society's view, then I'll go ahead and have sex with somebody else who's not my spouse because I'm told that's what I'm allowed to do. And that's why infidelity is on the rise. Um, 
2019 survey on infidelity, 20% of married men and 10% of married women. I think it's up to 24 and 12 now, but I didn't put that in there. It's, it's interesting to me that it's increasing among women as well as men. Right? So both men and women have bought into this idea that sex is about having certain feelings and indulging them when you have those feelings. It's... There are even websites set up so that you can uh, create hookups with people behind your spouse's back. Listen to the language of this. Life is short. Have an affair. What's the message in that? You deserve to have a fun, happy life where you get to do what you want to do. Maximize your pleasure, right? It's sort of what we looked at when we talked about the world's view of love, right? Associated with feelings of closeness or arousal. Same thing with sex. If, if it's all about the feeling, then hey, just go ahead and get on this website. You can hook up with somebody and your spouse will never even know. And by the way, if it's just about feeling a certain way and hooking up with somebody, it doesn't even have to be somebody who's the opposite sex. You know, you can hook up with somebody in the, of the opposite sex, uh, or the same sex if you want, and your wife will never know about it, or your husband will never know about it. And believe me, in our marriage prep in the last 14 years, we've seen a share of marriages that have fallen apart just for this very reason. You know, the husband or the wife are, you know, getting on sites and they're hooking up with people. Why? They've bought in somewhere, they've bought in somewhere to the attitude that sex is just an activity you're allowed to choose when you have certain feelings. We talked about married singles, right? And the consequences of married singles where you put something else ahead of your unity and, and your spouse, and what happens is you have isolation. That happens with sex too. When we treat sex as an activity that's driven by emotions, even within marriage, we end up in married singles. How? I'll give you five ways that married couples can call, fall into the trap of married singles when it comes to sex by treating it as just another activity. Number one, when we get too busy, whether it's our work, our friends, our interests, all kinds of things, when we put, start putting all of those things ahead of intimacy with our spouse, what we end up doing is we, we're focusing on our own fulfillment, and that activity of sex is just not a priority for me. It falls away and I start priority, prioritizing all these other things, and all of a sudden, that just doesn't seem very important. I put my job first, my interests, my children, my hobbies, and I'm going to relegate intimacy to leftover time. You know, i got all these other things to do. If I get all that done, maybe you and I can you know, be intimate together. Boy, what a disappointment. If you're standing on the altar taking the vow and you realize you might be thought of that way by your spouse at some point, you, you might be thinking, hey, that's, that's, that's not what we're doing here. But that's a common trap. Another trap. We can fall into the trap of treating sex as just another activity by focusing on satisfying my sexual drives or inclinations. It's all about me. It's all about my pleasure, my urgency, or lack of urgency. On the other side, I'll have sex with you if I feel urgent about doing it, but not if I don't, right? Or I'll have sex, I need sex, so I want sex now. It's all about how I, what I want and what you can do for me, deciding to have sex based on what I feel or don't feel. Three, focusing on performance or technique. You know, worrying about how I look or am I doing it right, that kind of thing, making it an activity that's a technique. You're missing the mark if we do that in marriage. And Look, when we do the retreats, Lena and I are very ob honest about this stuff. Okay, we, we get into it with the couples and, and we're, we're very honest with them that almost every one of these we've fallen into in our marriage at some point or another, 30 years. Yeah, we have. We've relegated it to whenever I have some leftover time or I've been selfish you know, in how I viewed sex or, I, or I've thought about it too much of as a performance kind of thing. Whenever that has happened, and, and I, I wish Lena were here because I always ask her to express this, that when, when I have done that in marriage, when I have treated sex as an activity among others, I ask her how that's made her feel, right? And she'll use words like cheap, used. It makes me feel isolated from you. It doesn't make me feel connected with you, right? And I think we all would, if we're honest, that's how we'd, we'd react. Four, 
Another way we can treat sex is just another activity and fall into that trap. We use sex, um, as, we reserve intimacy or affection for using it as a signal to wanting sex. We're not connected all day long, all week long, all month long. It's been maybe three months long where you haven't been connected, really. You're not telling me you love me and your little decisions and big decisions day in, day out. But all of a sudden, you come up behind me and you rub my shoulders out of the blue. I think you might be signaling that you have an itch you need me to scratch. Right? That sort of thing. If you're doing that, you know, and you're bringing me flowers all of a sudden, and, and this is out of the blue, and, you know, I might be thinking that you're trying to send me a smoke signal, that you really want to have sex, right? If we've gotten to that point, guess what? Uh, we've been treating it as an activity. Number five, um, we can treat it as a reward for good behavior or punishment for bad behavior. This is a common one in marriage. You know, it, it, the, the, the meme on the right says, now that you've bought the cow, the milk is extraordinarily expensive, right? The message behind that kind of thing is, oh, the wife will dole out sex if, you've been a, if you give me certain rewards, if you're really good to me, make my life good, whatever it is. Um, you know, if the guy's in the doghouse, forget about it. You're not having sex. Uh, and there's even, you know, nowadays, uh, political conditions placed on whether I'm going to have sex. You may have heard of this, certain women saying, I'm going on a sex strike because of the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs. You know, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, I'm going on a sex strike. You're not getting any until you align your political views with mine. That kind of attitude. If, if we are doling out intimacy with our spouse uh, based on as a reward or a punishment, withholding it as a punishment, we're treating it as an activity. This is another meme I just laughed at. You know, if I, if I act happy, go shopping with her, I might get sex later. You know, that kind of attitude is really messed up. I don't think you can hear this. If, if it'll play, I'll, I'll try. Let me see if you can hear it. No, you, you can't hear it. But I'll show you what's happening. It was a jack-in-the-box ad I came across, right? They're playing, they're playing Scrabble and... Uh, and, and he spells out one of his uh, culinary creations. What was it? Swavery. They, it was something where, you know, you, you'd get a sweet and savory, and so he, he spelled swavery. And she's like, what's that? You know, where do you get that? And, and, and he's like, well, yeah, it's, it's when you get sweet and savory. And she looks at it, and then she's spelling a word of her own, and it, and it says, no nookie. And he looks down and, you know, gets this look on his face like, oh, I've done it now. It was funny. It's humorous. But the message behind it is he's been a bad boy, so we're not going to have any intimacy between us. That's, that's what happens. What happens if we treat sex and marriage as an activity among others? I want you to do an exercise. Think of something you have purchased or been given, an object, that at the time you got it, you were so excited about. You were, you were just over the moon because you got this thing. For me, I got a, a, a very expensive Taylor acoustic guitar. Okay? I, I play guitar. I, I love this guitar. When I got that thing, I would polish it every time I used it. I would clean the strings meticulously up and down the fretboard. I, you know, I'd put it in, tuck it into its case, kiss it goodnight, you know. I just, I, I love that guitar and I treated it, you know, so well. Every object, whatever you were thinking of, loses its luster, right? After a while, I still love my guitar. It's, it's a great guitar, but I'm not quite as careful with it. I don't wipe it down quite so much. You know, I'll even put it in there without cleaning the strings sometimes. You know, to be honest, strings right now, they're pretty dirty. It won't play as well. And I hate to have neglected her, but, you know, this is the truth. And every object is like that. A new iPhone, it's so great when you first get it, you know, and then after a few months, I wonder what the new iPhone's like, you know? That's because objects aren't meant to capture us like people, right? Every object loses its luster. If we treat sex as an it in marriage, if we treat sex as something less than a self-donated donative 
full giving myself to the other person, you, uh, the recapitulation of our vows. Guess what? We're going to get in a rut. We're going to get bored. We're going to grow apart. We eventually become bored with anything. We're left feeling unfulfilled. The romance disappears. After all, I've been treating sex as an activity I do when I feel like it. If it loses its luster, I no longer feel like it. We don't do it anymore. Guess what? We're not connected. And um, when it becomes just another activity and we're just looking for our pleasure, what we're really we're doing that whole time is using another person. We're using the person that we just read those vows about. We end up using them. And that's about the saddest thing ever. John Paul II, in his book, Love and Responsibility, he said the opposite of love when it comes to a person isn't hate, but use. The opposite of love when it comes to a person isn't hate, but use. We are to love people and use things, but too often we do the reverse. So, if we want to avoid doing that within our marriages and having the destruction in our marriages that can cause, for example, I mean, I had a, a good friend and bandmate who played in a band together for 20 years, and a uh, great guy. Uh, he and his wife were married the entire time my wife and I were married, and one day announced that they were getting divorced. And it came as a huge shock, and I said, well, you know, what's, what's going on? And he says, well, I mean, we haven't made love in two years. Um, and these, these aren't, you know, older people like me. At the time, we were 30s. And, uh, and he, he's, I said, what, what do you mean? How did that happen? What's going on? He said, yeah, man, we just, um, we just are not connected. We haven't been connected forever. You know, we're... we're I've been doing my thing, she's been doing hers, and, you know, we just, just stopped making love, and it's been till that's it. It's over, right? That took a lot of work to get to that stage. It took a lot of neglect. It took a lot of treating her as an object and him treating his, him as an object and, and growing apart. If we don't want that to happen, if instead we want uh, our marriage to flourish and our closeness to be regenerated time and time again, then what we do is we, have, we, we see sex according to God's plan in marriage. Remember that passage that we read last night from Genesis. At last, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. At last, that elation, that feeling, our sexual attraction and capacity to be joined to one another aren't by accident. They're part of God's plan for us. We're designed for self-donation, complete self-donation. And the, the, the church teaches that we can't really find ourselves as the human person without making a sense gift to another. Whether that's in the vocation of marriage or another marriage. You know, if, if we want to understand and find the best part of ourselves, it's going to be through self-donation. We're designed to be a gift to another. And every act of love involves our bodies, whether that's helping somebody move a piano. Imagine your friend said, hey, you know, you love me, right? I'm your friend. Yeah, I do. Saturday, can you come over and help me move? You know, and you really don't have anything else to do, but you're like, nah, you know, I'm, I'm out. Thanks anyways, you know. Well, you're not really showing me you love me. You know, you're just saying you love me, but if you come pick up a box and help me put that in my apartment, it, you know, it'd be really a, a way of showing me you love me, right? Our, we show the way we love one another through our actions, through our bodies. And so too in sexual intimacy and marriage. In marriage, a man and woman give themselves completely to one another emotionally, spiritually, and physically. We are made for union in our, in our complementarity, in the way our bodies are designed, in the way our, our spirits are designed in every way. And that language, that language of the body of total gift of self to one another, that language of intercourse in marriage, where we're saying with our bodies what we said in our vows, I give myself to you totally, completely, permanently, that's intended to be that, that complete, total union. The permanent, 
exclusive, faithful, completely open to, to one another union. Um, now, I mentioned this the other night, uh, that intimacy is a renewal of the wedding vows. Is there a better form of communication of saying to your wife or husband, I love you, than giving yourself in intimacy to one another? Where it's not an activity, where it's not reducing things to ple- your, your personal pleasure or relegation to when I feel like it, but rather as an expression, a true expression of that love you have for one another. Contra- contrast this with the thing, the object that always grows old. If lovemaking between us as spouses is personal, it never gets old. Do you tire hearing from your spouse, I love you? I don't. I don't. It never gets old to me. I want to hear it. I would like to... I, 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 that's how we view intimacy too. If we're viewing intimacy that way, then we'll never get tired of it anyway, either. It's not separate from the rest of our relationship. It's the culmination of the way we say we love one another all day long. And this is a concept called all-day lovemaking, right? Day-long lovemaking. If we're treating sex as an activity, it's this thing that we do kind of haphazardly, randomly. If, if we're treating sex as the embodiment of our vows and complete self-donation to one another, we've already adopted that attitude day to day in our marriage. We've already said to her or him every day in little things a thousand times, I love you. I give myself to you completely. If we've been doing that day long, day in, day out, making love is, is a natural extension to that. It's a natural expression of it. We're already completely connected. And this is very freeing because I'm not having sex with my wife or husband because they have certain qualities or it's fleeting things that might change. Because the reality, and we tell this to engaged couples, the reality is you're going to meet people while you're married that have better qualities than your spouse in some way or another. Guess what? Somebody might have a better hairline. They might have, you know, be more athletic. Uh, they, they might make more money. You know, they might have a better figure. They might be able to cook better. You're, you're going to rub elbows with lots of people while you're married, right? And you're going to say, I don't really care about any of that <laughs> because I married this person for who she is and I love everything about her the way she is. I, I, I told you, this has really been a revelation to me the last couple years, reading, reaching a, another level of maturity in our marriage where I, I, I really f- say honestly to her that I love everything about her, even all of her little faults and foibles and shortcomings. I, they, they bring me joy. They're opportunities for me to love her. And that that's comes through habit, through repetition, day in, day out, of treating her as that, as this unique, irreplaceable, irrepeatable person that can't be found elsewhere, regardless of whether somebody has a bigger bank account or a better hairline or something else. So if sexual union in marriage is a communication of persons, divorce, the idea of it becomes impossible, since that person is irreplaceable. Is this making sense to you? <clears throat> now, uh, we, we typically, in our marriage preparation retreats at this point, spend some time emphasizing the life-giving aspect of sex. Right? So, sex has two integral, interrelated, inseparable elements. The unitive and the procreative. The unitive, the bonding of the husband and wife, the regeneration of their vows, an expression of their vows that brings warmth and affection between them, brings them close. The other side of that coin is that sex is the act that God has chosen to generate human beings. Right? It's the way that it's done. They are intimately connected, intertwined, and they can't be separate. And the church teaches you know, that the two aspects of marital intercourse, unitive and procreative, belong to every act of marital intercourse by God's design 
and may never be separated. Every act of marital intercourse must remain open to new life. It's a grave matter, a sin, to intentionally and directly separate one from the other. To intentionally prevent conception is a sin. And, and this can be a difficult thing for young couples. It may be difficult for somebody in this room. Who knows? But it's important because it's part of the good news of marriage. The church teaches this. Have you, ha, raise your hand if you've read Humane Vitae. So, so some people have. If you haven't, Go get it online and read it. It's only like 23 pages, I don't know, maybe even not that many. It's short. It's a letter written in 1968, uh, encyclical, on human life, right? This is, this is where the church gave us definitively this teaching on the inseparability between the marital union and the... the, the procreative and the unitive aspects of sex. And, and the explication of this is very clear, very concise, and very prophetic. It tells if we start separating this, these two aspects of sex, there are dire consequences. And I'm here to tell you it was prophetic. We're seeing it all around us in our culture. Uh, I talked about how in 1965 the Griswold decision was the first one which said Married couples are, have a constitutional right to use contraception in marriage. Well, our, our, we've taken a nosedive since then. If you can, go and read it. Um, we, we often spend a lot of time here on natural family planning. I don't know if that's something that anybody's interested in hearing anything about. Let me give a, a quick pitch here. When the church teaches that every marital act has to be open to the possibility of procreation, does it mean the church is saying you have to have uh, as many kids as humanly possible. No. She does not teach that. She teaches that we have to be open to life, maintain an attitude of openness to life, and do nothing to intentionally destroy the procreative aspect in, of sex. If there are grave reasons, serious reasons, for spacing children or avoiding a, pre, a, 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 a conception at some point in your marriage, there are licit ways to do that and stay true to the church's teaching. Natural family planning is the predominant one. And I'm, you probably all know about natural family planning. I won't, I won't spend a lot of time, but it's essentially a way of recognizing uh, signatures and symptoms in the woman's cycle so that you can identify fertile periods. And if you have an important reason for attempting to space a child at that point, you abstain from uh, in intimacy during those periods. Now, when, when I got married uh, 30 years ago, uh, it was a rudimentary thing where you had, you know, you had a chart on your wall and you had to have stickers of different colors and you had to plot it and it was like almost took a you know, degree in some science of some sort to do it. Uh, technology has advanced since then. There are, there, are, there are machines and apps that can be used to help detect the, the patterns in a woman's cycle. Uh, if Lena were here, she would be talking about this, by the way, not me. But, um, you know, there's a, 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 leave it to the Germans, but they created a, a, a thing called a baby comp or a lady comp that is a little computer that sits by your bedside and has a thermometer and you put it in every morning and it reads all of your signs and it'll tell you, uh, you know, when you're fertile, when you're not fertile, when you're going to have your period. It knows like that. So, you know, if there are reasons, important, grave reasons, is actually the language that's used in the encyclical, if there's, there are grave reasons for spacing, that's a licit way because you're not doing something to separate the act of sex, the procreative and the unitive aspects of sex. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, and what I planned on doing was talking some about the actual sacrament of marriage at this point. Uh, before we go on to that, I, I want to, is, are there any questions about the last things that we've covered? Okay.
Let's talk about the sacrament of marriage for a minute. Uh, that's my son, Blaze, and his wife, Kristen, uh, when they got married in 2011. Um, the matrimonial covenant by which a man and woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole of life is by nature ordered toward the good of the spouses and procreation and education of offspring. This covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. Sacraments, you all... I'm sure you know what a sacrament is. You've been, you've been this. In fact, Father has done such a good job in some of his homilies in talking about sacraments. He's, I know for a fact you've been educated on what sacraments are. But God wants to relate to us through physical means. We see this even in the incarnation. The eternally begotten Son of the Father takes on flesh. He's, God is made visible to us in a bodily way, right? In a sense, he's the first sacrament, this, this visible sign of, of God's life. And, and when Jesus was present on earth, he liked to use physical things to, to show God's presence. Whether it's taking the dirt on the ground and making mud you know, to perform a miracle, whether it's the wedding feast at Cana, where, you know, whether he uses different implements to heal to feed, to forgive, the multiplication of the loaves. Jesus was always doing things with physical objects, right? That didn't stop after he left us visibly on earth, right? A sacrament, a basic definition, as you probably all know, an outward sign instituted by Christ to confer grace. An outward sign instituted by Christ to confer grace. We all know there's seven of them. Baptism, communion, confirmation, confession, matrimony, holy orders, and anointing of the sick. So what's grace? If it's conferring grace, what is grace? Grace is a freely given sharing in the life of Christ. It's a way of sharing, participating in Christ's life. Grace is favor. Free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to His call and become children of God, adoptive sons and daughters, partakers in the divine nature. So, sacraments are efficacious signs. Signs normally just point us to something, right? A yield sign, a railroad crossing, uh, any sign you can think of. But sacraments as signs effectuate in us on a spiritual level the thing that they signify on the actual level. So, let me give you an example, a common one that's used. Imagine a stop sign that could actually stop your car. It not only signifies something, it effectuates, brings about that which it's signifying. You came up to that stop sign and it stopped your car. And every sacrament has matter and form, right? The stuff of the sacrament and the way it's brought about. The form, the stuff is the matter, the, the way is the form. And it signifies something through that matter and form. We can all think of this one. Baptism is pretty easy, right? You got the matter. What is it? It's the water. The form is the, the formula. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and the pouring or, or immersion in the water. And who does it? The minister does it. But it can be done in emergencies by somebody who isn't a minister. Um, I baptized Blaze. Don't, don't tell anybody, but I baptized him on a plane. So, uh, yeah, and it was an emergency in my view, and, and I baptized him. So, uh, the Eucharist, matter and form. The, the matter, what is it? It's the bread and the wine. The form is, the, this is my body. The, the words that the priest says at Mass. And, and what does it signify? I didn't talk about signifying. So, the sacrament of baptism signifies cleansing. It's an easy one. We can conceive of it. Eucharist, also, it's an easy one. Nourishment and, and communion with one another as the church, right? So, what about marriage? In the sacrament of matrimony, this one is a really interesting one. And so, usually when we, we go through this, I take a lot more time. I'm, I'm speeding a little bit because of our time constraints here, but this is an interesting one because it's not always quite so obvious to people. What is the matter of the sacrament? And what is the form? In the sacrament of matrimony, 
The husband and wife, the man and the woman, are the matter. There's nothing else that we're bringing in. It's not the rings. It's not a candle. It's, it's these people, the two people. I find that like fascinating, don't you? That the, it's, it's the only sacrament where it's like that. that we're the matter. The bodies of the bride and groom. The form is the vows that we give, freely given with mutual consent. Done according to the, the form of the church, the way it's done. You have to have certain requirements. Um, you know, we're baptized, we're free to enter, all the things we talked about before. Um, and the, the church, of course, has authority to administer the sacraments. So there, you know, there are certain things that the church requires as a matter of form for it to, to be a valid mar- marriage. You have to, you're about to be baptized, free to enter marriage, consent. It's before an ordained minister, you know, um, male and female witness, and in a church. And, you know, you can get, my father can tell you more about this. I'm sure you get a lot of couples coming in and wanting to get married on the beach and wanting to get married in the mountains, wanting to, you know, get married by the river. You know, it's, it takes some talking to. Well, no, that's not what we're doing here. Again, it's just like the vows. You don't get to just do your own thing. Um, and so if, if every sacrament is an efficacious sign, what does the, the sign of sacrament, of, a sacrament of marriage signify? What does it signify? A comprehensive union of body and will that's permanent, exclusive, and ordered toward family life. The two become one flesh. I mean, and we see that in, in the exchange of the vows, the husband and wife on the altar, exchanging those vows in front of everyone. And the, the supernatural signification of that is a permanent, faithful, fruitful love of Jesus for His bride, the church. We talked about that yesterday. Our, our entering into a covenantal relationship with one another in the church, in the mystical body, is a reflection of Jesus' marriage to the church. Right? We participate in that. And so, you know, the sacrament of matrimony confers grace on the couples and enables us to live out that mutual and lasting fidelity toward one another. And, and, you know, we often hear people talk about, you know, well, why do I need to get married? You know, it's just a piece of paper. It's just a, and yeah, it is. If it's, if it's just a civil marriage, that's what it is. It's a piece of paper. Marriage as a sacrament is something so much more than that. Marriage as a sacrament confers on us the grace to live out this incredible vocation. It confers on us. It gives us the grace to forgive one another through this lifetime commitment. To love one another through this lifetime commitment. To donate ourselves to one another. All of the things that it says. Jesus doesn't tell lies. Jesus doesn't tell lies. Right? When He established the sacrament of marriage, He didn't give us something and say, well, good luck. You know? No, He's going to give us the grace in our marriage. You know, we open ourselves up to it. We take our vows seriously. We, we get deeper and deeper into it in our understanding and living it day by day. Guess what? He's going to give us the grace to make it this thing that it should be. This total, permanent, loving, life-giving unit. And, and the world's going to see that. And I think that's the, the thing I want to leave you with here. Why are we doing this mission over the last three days? Why did Father do this? There was an, you know, some people expressed, we need some support for marriage. We need to talk about marriage. The world needs us. The world needs us desperately to have good marriages. The world's in total confusion and disarray when it comes to marriage. How will they get the good news of marriage without us? How will they ever know it? So let's, let's take this seriously. Let's study it. Let's understand it. Read the Catechism. Read Humana Vitae. Read Familiaris Consortia. Read the documents of the church on this. Pray them. And, and I guarantee you, you'll get grace through that that's going to build a bond with your wife or your husband that, that even you couldn't have imagined. The more you do it, day in, day out, year in, year out, the stronger the marriage becomes and people flock to it then. People see it and they say, man, 
like the early church. You know how the church spread? It didn't spread through you know, going around conquest or anything like that. It spread because people saw that Christians were different. They said, hey, what's going on with these people? Well, we need a regeneration of that in marriage. Don't we? We need to bring the example of what real marriage looks like to the rest of the world by living it in our marriages and then showing how life-giving it is. Not just in terms of having children, that's great, but I mean our marriages are life-giving even if we don't have children. Even if we couldn't have children, they're going to give life to people. My brother Steve, his wife, they couldn't have kids. But they live this nonetheless, and their marriage is as life-giving as ours with seven kids. They've touched innumerable people through their example. So let's be that to one another as married couples. Let's be that support for one another to challenge one another to live up to what our vocation is. And then let's bring that out to the rest of the world. Amen? Amen. And before we go to uh, uh, some question time, I just want to say, like, why it's such an important thing for us to, to live out those uh, holy marriages. It's because it's not just a, a personal thing. It's not just like for individual uh, purpose. It's not just for you as married couples to live those lives of holy marriages. Um, but if the marriage is chosen by Jesus to show the image of his love for the church, the first thing that Evo is trying to attack is the image of God's love for us, to create a doubt. Because if in the marriage we representing the love of God for his church and those marriages are imperfect, and I'm not, so not, not saying about the imperfection of every individual human being because there will be imperfect in this way always, but they are perfect in their pursuit of holiness through a sacramental union, that total union, that union in which one gives the other totally and, and receives in return totally the other person. It, we need to live it out so that the image goes to the world. This is how God loves us. This is how he loves us. That is unconditional love. That is the love that, that has no limits. The love that has so much power that, that gives everything. Um, and that's why marriage is, is under the state of attack. Because marriage was chosen by God to signify to us how much he loves us. This is why Church is the bride. Jesus is the groom. And that imagery exists throughout the history of the church. That how it always was presented. Because that is the union that God meant. That is indissoluble. That is leading to holiness. And that is sacrificial. So this is the purpose why the marriage needs to be emphasized. Why the marriage, holy marriages need to be brought into light and shown to the world. So that people may know how God loves them. And because I think that in our times, the fact that God loves us is questioned. People would say, the war in, in, in uh, Ukraine, how does God love those people? They say, all oh, the uh, natural disasters when people lose their lives. How, God, how, how does God love people? Monday shooting in Nashville. How does God love us? And there's going to be those doubts whenever there's things that are going to happen. And the question that people will be asking and the answer is, that's how he loves us. Look at my marriage. Look at my commitment to my spouse. In good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. Jesus did not say just that. He showed it. Until death do us part. But he did even more. Death did not separate us from him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And the marriage here on earth is the closest sign to that love of God that he has for us. So thank you, Tom, for your time and for your uh, effort and for your ministry. But I would like to open now the, uh, the room for uh, the questions. If there are any. Doesn't look like there are any questions at this time, which means that uh, either we're not listening or <laughs> the topic was really exhausted. But it was not exhausted. And as Tom said, it takes the entire weekend to, to teach that. So there's a lot of information that is just short and simplified. Obviously, we are here in an environment where all of you are married and all of you have the experience of that and all of you have been to a degree prepared for that mission of marriage here on the world, in the world. 
But I would like to uh, uh, encourage you to continuously grow in your marriages, to continue grow individually as husbands, wives, but also as marriages, as two who became one. Um, and I would like you also to uh, continue to ask you to give the, the witness to your children, to your friends, to others who may be struggling with the idea of marriage or idea of God's love for them so that they can see it in us. They know we are Christians by our love, by our love. That's uh, the hymn that we sing quite often. Uh, and that's the true hymn. That's the true thing that makes us different, that we know and understand what love is. Not a feeling, not a pleasure, not a me thing, but it's a sacrificial thing that we offer for the sake of the other. Um, as we have done in the past, I don't know, Tony, if you have a question? Okay. So I want to go back to the one slide you had where you talked about um, procreation. There was two points. I think it was unity. Unitive and procreative. Right. So you have seven kids, right, and you're talking to your children that are not married. Procreation is pretty straightforward. How do you talk to your children about the unity side and just what, what's that? Unitive. Unitive. Just in terms of if, if you're encouraging your kids to wait to have sex until you're yeah. married, procreation is straightforward, right? How, I mean, just... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd say a couple things to that. So bonding and babies is a short form where it's unitive and procreative, right? Bonding and babies. And I think of a confessor that I had when I was at the University of San Francisco, an old Jesuit, a crusty old Jesuit who spent a lot of hours in the confessional. And I, I uh, was back in college at the time, con confessed a, a sin of a sexual nature. And he, he, in his inimitable fashion, you know, said, now don't play games with God. You're not married. And it was, he was so abrupt. So it, and, I, and, he, and I thought, wow, okay, he really came at me for that. And I, and I thought about it later. What did he mean by that? Playing games. You're playing games because let me, let me tell, I tell my kids this. If you're engaging in sex with someone and you're not married, you're telling a profound lie. You are telling a profound lie with your body. You're saying I'm giving myself to you and I'm taking you, but you haven't actually vowed that at all. So that's a lie. You're lying with your body. And here's the problem. You're going to bond in some way whether you want to or not because your bodies have been united. That generates often feelings of closeness. That's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to generate feelings of closeness. But that's going to create problems because it's not your wife. It's not your husband. And what's going to happen is it's ultimately going to lead to unhappiness and despair. And you're going to have memories that you can't live up to from then on because you bonded with somebody who isn't your wife or your husband. So you're telling a lie with your body, you haven't said it with your lips, with your vows, and it's, gonna, it's going to bond you to that person in some way that later on you might realize, you know, I didn't, wa I didn't want to be bonded that way with this person. Or, conversely, <laughs> you know, if you do that bonding over and over again and treat it as an activity, treat it as something that's just another recreational form you can do, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose all connection to that bonding in the first place. You're going to get exactly what you bargained for. That's a fleeting sexual pleasure. And that's all it'll become. And then you've lost the ability to bond the way you should in marriage. So I, I think I've tried to impress on my kids that, and I think they've seen it our, in our marriage, that Lena and I are not, we're not prudes in our marriage, you know, we talk about sex with our kids and they see us be very affectionate with one another. They know that it's an important part of our marriage. I try to teach them that, look, the, the only, the way that it bonds us is we have, we see it for what it is. The, the embodiment of our vow to self donate to one another, our to complete giving to one another. Do you want that kind of bond? What kind of bond do you want? Do you want the kind of bond it's intended to generate that will last a lifetime, that will regenerate love for your spouse over and over again, that will create virtues in you, you know, like patience and resilience and forgiveness? Do, do you want that kind of bond? 
Because the way you get that is through sacramental marriage. You don't get it the way the world tells you you're going to get it in sex. What you're going to get is exactly what you've made sex into if you bond that way. It's going to be something cheap, fleeting, not lasting, and ultimately not going to make you happy. I also want to say something which maybe sometimes escapes us. Uh, in the uh, Ten Commandments, the, sac- the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is between the two other commandments. One is thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Uh, it's because sacrament, uh, uh, the sins against uh, human sexuality are sins that, first of all, kill the purpose of our bodies. Our bodies are not for the purpose of pleasure. Our bodies are not for the purpose of entertainment. Our bodies for the sake of union. Uh, and it, if it's not, our body is not used in this way, it's, it's, it's abused. And that's why the body is killed. So it's, that's one side of that, is that uh, sins against our sexuality are, are killing what God created us to be in the form of our sexuality. And then second, on the other hand, is, is thou shalt not steal. It's because they take something that does not belong to us. They take something that is, belongs to the beauty of the total union with the sacrament of, 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 of marriage. And if it's taken out of that context, it's just stealing, something that, that literally does not belong to us, something that belongs to God, something that belongs to maybe a person that is there that God has for me in, a, in, a, in a, this form of, of union, which is sacramental marriage. But if I'm taking it out of that context, I'm literally a thief. I once asked someone who is, uh, how do you call someone who steals? And I got a response, stealer. Um, so I'm not sure if they were from um, uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, yes, <laughs> but m- maybe they were. But uh, if we're committing sins against our sexuality, we are uh, both mur- murderers and thieves. Uh, we're murdering the purpose of our bodies, and we are stealing something that does not belong to us. And then again, from what we have stolen, we're not going to benefit. That's why it's that fleeting aspect of it. If something is owned. It's, it's giving that lasting, long uh, thing. Uh, it's like when you borrow a car from a rental place. It's a fun car to drive, but it doesn't belong to you. But if you have a car that is your own, like your guitar, you can take care of it, you can look into it, and you can um, pay attention to it. Again, still we're not talking about objects, because obviously uh, our uh, intimacy and sexuality is not about ob- objectifying, but it's kind of like an analogy, hopefully. That's understandable. Any other questions, Sue? Just to add to that, Father, when I, when I meet with couples, when I meet with couples for marriage prep, that's one thing I always ask. If they are living together, it takes them a while before they finally answer, we are living together. And I explain the same thing what Tom and, and Father are saying, how Giving of yourself in that manner really isn't that sacramental marriage that you're really looking for. You know, it's, it, it's kind of the, the cheap way around it, you know. So I encourage them, if they are living together, if they have another bedroom, one of them move in there. And save yourself for that time when they do come to marriage. When you do go to the church and you say those vows, then, after that day is done, whenever it is going to be, and you consummate that marriage, that's when God really puts wholeheartedly everything in that sacrament of of marriage. And it takes them back to think about what they really are looking for in that marriage. So it's something that we all have to encourage especially our new couples in this day and age, because they're bombarded by everything else that say, no, no, it's okay to do that. You can live together. It's okay to have sex. Our society is telling them that. But we have to be the ones to say, that's what society says. It's not what God wants. And I don't know if it's been your experience in doing marriage prep and, and you've raised that issue, but when couples have taken us up on that challenge and have separated until they're married, we've had so many instances of couples that have come back and thanked us for giving them that advice because it gave them a, a certain distance that enabled them to see with greater clarity what they were doing 
to free themselves from attachments that were there uh, and enter the sacrament more fully in some way. They, had, they, had, they, they, they got it. They got a sense of just how important it was. It's been a great gift to them, even if they've been married, uh, living for years together, and they separate for six months or three months, it made a big difference to them. And you know what? Uh, one of the most commonly brought up uh, reasons for people living together, they will always have those excuses. It's economical reasons. Uh, so currently, Archdiocese of Denver is working on creating a fund for uh, the married couples, or the couples in preparation for marriage, to uh, support them financially because then they will not have that excuse as economical reasons. Because there might be a legitimate way of saying, are we living together for economical reasons? Um, but Archdiocese of Denver is, is in the preparation of, of the fund that, that uh, every couple who comes to the priest and says that we live in together, the priest will say, you know what? I'll have a place for you. So it, even to the point of renting a place for someone, uh, one of them, so that they, they do not have that excuse. Because I think until the, till this time, it was very much of a, empty words, like we're saying that we should not live together. But again, if there's economical reasons, then we will overcome. That's, that's the easiest reason to overcome. Um, and, and that's the, the fund that is being prepared. Uh, and the parishes are also encouraged to have their own funds. So there's always solutions to that. Because again, it's not a reason, it's just an excuse. Um, and I want to say that when it comes to deacon and conversations, I have developed a little different format than deacon because every time when I have a couple, the first thing that I'm asking them was, what's your good mailing address? And if they're both <laughs> mailing addresses the same, uh, that kind of reveals the whole story. Intel. Uh, but but it, it, it happens. And again, that, that usually if I'm asking the first one, the first one is just easy, and the second one is like, uh, same. <laughs> so now, now, now we have a conversation. Uh, to go. Also, um, I want to just touch because we're all going to fo go for our adoration in a moment. Um, just about the fruitfulness of the union. Um, Tom said about uh, openness to life. Uh, you may have a question in your head. So, for example, what is a, in a case like an uh, older couple? Uh, they may not be fertile anymore in the sense of, you know, not able physically, biologically to create offspring. Uh, can they get married? Yes. Uh, because they are not intrinsically closed to procreation. Just the biological thing, which is uh, at this moment of their lives, which is making it almost impossible. Uh, we say almost because you know, there were instances when people at the age of 60, they still got pregnant. Uh, but there is also a question of um, marriages or unions, because they are not marriages, of people of the same sex and why the church will... Uh, never have authority to bless those unions, it's because they cannot be fruitful. Uh, biologically, it's impossible for two males or two females to be fruitful. It's intrinsically contradictory to fruitfulness in the form of creating offspring. So this is why the unions that are infertile uh, cannot be entered into a, in, a, in a sacramental way. But that also is in the same sense of the union of the people who are of the opposite sexes who are infertile and they know about it. They cannot enter a sacramental union. They can enter a valid marriage, but they cannot enter a sacramental union because they cannot be open to life because they are, they are prevented from that. So, for example, people who have uh, gone through a vasectomy or people who have done some medical procedures or even people who know that they are infertile because of their testing. Uh, they cannot enter a sacramental union. They can, can enter valid uh, marriage, and, but it's, a, it's where the church does not differentiate between you know, the, the genders or sexes. It's like if the union cannot be fruitful, it cannot be sacramental because that's one of the elements. So, so if someone asks you right, why church does not bless or recognize the, the unions between two people that are saying of the same sex, it's just a simple. It just does not fulfill one of the, the necessary conditions for, for the union, which is fruitfulness. But again, it does not discriminate because also the, the, the opposite sex unions can sometimes be infertile and they also have the same response. If you are not able to be fruitful, then you cannot receive the sacrament of marriage. Uh, once again, Tom, Lena, Thank you for uh, your time and preparation. Of course. Thank you, Father. And uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. And I, we moved to Fort Collins a month ago. And the worst part about moving, it's been great. I love it. But not being in this parish and not especially having the benefit of Father Tomaj, whom we grew 
very much to love over the last two years, two and a half years we were here. Uh, it's, been, it's been really difficult. You all have a, just an incredible parish, incredible people, beautiful, wonderful, warm people, and an amazing pastor. So thank you for, for doing this for all of us. Thank you, Tom. And um, unbeknownst to you, I have been recording those sessions, so apologies, I never asked for permission. Um, but those sessions are available on our uh, YouTube channel. So if you would like to listen from the beginning, Monday, Tuesday, and today's session will be, uh, today's session will be uh, uploaded a little later, uh, probably by 10 p.m. Uh, um, but uh, if you would like to go and refresh yourselves with what we have heard Monday and Tuesday, it's on our YouTube. So please do use it. Uh, please do share it. If uh, you have anyone who would like to hear it, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, and I'll apologize to Tom and Lena <laughs> in private. All right, uh, let's take seven minutes break. So five minutes till eight, uh, 7.55, we'll begin our adoration in the church. I invite you there. I'll be also available for that uh, time of adoration until 8.30 for the Sacrament of Reconciliation, if you so uh, desire.